So how you doing, everyone? This is David W. Williams, also known as Diamond Dave, the founder of the highest paid part-time job in the world, Options Training Academy. So let me know if you can hear me. Let me know my audio is actually coming through. And we could go ahead and get right into it. Um, let me do this real quick, okay. Having a, uh, a connectivity issue with my headphones. So that's one of the challenges that I'm dealing with. Okay, so what we're going to do today is we're going to do an options Q&A, and then we're going to also do uh, a free giveaway. That gain is up real high. My bad. We're going to do a free giveaway. We also got an options Q&A. Um, anybody got any questions, I gave you the stream yard link. You can go ahead and get on. I see uh, Miss Alexandria got on real quick. So um, Katrina, uh, or Miss Alexandria, before I go ahead and bring you on, let me go ahead and say this real quick, and then we're going to go ahead and get right to it. So... Uh, first off, we're getting ready to go into the second quarter. We're getting ready to go into the third and fourth quarter of the year. We see what the Federal Reserve Monetary Policy is. Uh, they pretty much laid out a schedule of how they're going to uh, move the rates up as time goes on. And so what we want to kind of look at is what particular sectors of the economy are going to be impacted by those. Right. So what I'm looking at from a, a, a standpoint of plays is that what particular companies are going to be impacted by the raising rates and some of them have already been impacted before um, because of an anticipation but some of them are going to continue to be impacted so you know i'm gonna give you a scenario so let's say i have a, a, a company to where they drive a certain amount of revenue but their profit margins dependent upon the cost of energy which we're going to call the gas it's also dependent upon uh, how many customers they bring in which we understand and then they also may need financing to run their business so you got certain businesses to where pretty much every quarter they borrow money to get through the quarter right they pay it back they do it again a lot of really big corporations a lot of people don't know they finance their operations the cost of capital goes up what that does is it makes that payout greater or it makes extends the payout so normally we might pay that back in six months now we may end up having to pay that back over the course of the year because of the raise in the rate also, it makes, we talked about before, it makes the cost of capital greater. Then on top of that, energy costs are higher. So it costs more to run my business. Therefore, with those challenges, it can impact their margin of profit. And we understand that when you're buying stock, you're buying a discounted price of the future. So I'm buying stock today because I believe that it's going to be cheaper to buy today than it will be by five years from now. If their margins are going to be hit over the course of six months to a year, it may be cheaper for me to wait six months to a year to buy it than to buy it right now, unless I just want to park my capital. And so those are kind of the things that I'm looking at. So this is how my mind works in the market. So people ask me, how do I get ahead of the market? How am I able to position myself to where when these things happen, I'm already positioned? Because I'm looking at this before things start to take place. People say, well, you can't predict where stock is going. You're 100% correct. But you have to forecast. Because if you can't forecast, why buy any stock? Right? Why buy into the overall U.S. stock market, which is to buy into an index fund, if you don't believe that the price of that, what you're buying will be greater in 10 years or 20 years when you get ready to retire than it currently is today. So if you're investing in your 401k, it's because you believe that the value of that 401k will be greater when you get ready to retire 65 years old than it is right now while you're buying it. If you don't believe that, why would you buy it? So then therefore, you're forecasting the future. You're not going to do this. You're not doing discounted cash flows. You're believing that this group of people have done that work for you. Therefore, you got confidence. I know what kind of work I need to do to have confidence in my analysis. And I don't look for somebody on YouTube to tell me what the play is because there's people on YouTube that have gone to finance schools and they was talking about three, four months ago that Carvana was the play. And I'm like, this, I don't understand where they're getting this from. But because nobody can, they don't allow this. See, I don't I don't even care if you bought my course if you want to have a conversation with me because I just like to talk about the markets. It's two things I talk about all day, the markets and marketing. Just talk about it all day, won't get tired of talking about it. Because if I'm dealing with somebody that I know has a high level of intelligence in that area, they raising my intelligence, they're not making me dumber, Right. So that's why I try to keep getting us engaged in the conversation because it raises the level of intelligence around the area. So one of the reasons why I've been so successful this year and plan on being successful next year 
is because I'm thinking about how are these things going to be impacting specific companies before it ever happens? Because I understand how these companies are set up. So really quickly, some of the tickers I'm looking at, I'm looking at HYG, right? I believe that's the ticker. Looking at JNK, uh, looking at MBB. I, the the, the sell-off of MBB may have already taken place because I think we're at around 5.5% on the 30-year. But we can still go up. We can go up to seven or eight. You know, depends on how this thing rolls out. Also looking at logistics companies. And I don't just mean Amazon. I don't just mean uh, UPS, even though they're included. Don't just mean just Amazon. Um, looking at the logistics, the long distance truckers, right? How are they going to deal with uh, high cost, high energy cost? How are they going to deal with inflation? Things of that nature, right? Same issue. If they got to finance their operations, the cost of capital is going to be greater. Any business that is weak in this environment is going to be under a lot of pressure. Because historically, what they can do is sell a good narrative to their shareholders, then go into the capital markets and get capital from the capital markets that, you know, over the past two years, you get capital damn that zero percent. Go to traditional finance and they may charge you, a, you know, two, three, maybe four percent. Traditional financing right now, man, you know, they may charge you eight, nine percent on capital. You already have a weak business. You're able to use that to carry yourself until you can kind of figure it out. We're not in that environment anymore. And it's the reason why people like Kathy Wood, and I may talk about this week, are begging the Federal Reserve to change monetary policy. Why? Because she can't operate in a high cost of capital environment. She can't. And this is what I want people to understand. We've been taught our whole life that these people are just better than us or they're just, you know, smarter than us. That they just have, you know, this lie about their culture. And this, uh, you can never say that about other ethnic groups. And once we really get down to the bare tax, right? And what I mean by that is that when you, uh, I'm sorry, to the brass tax. And what I mean by that is when you old school houses, when you pull that rug up, there's brass tax on the, on the actual wood that's holding the wood panels down. We realize that without low cost of capital, they can't even operate. So is it that they're good or is that they are able to operate in an environment where the monetary policy gives them an advantage, their access gives them their advantage, their relationships give them advantage, but once they lose the monetary policy, everything else doesn't matter. Kathy Wood got a long track record in, in uh, managing money. She came from some of the top educational firms, educational uh, institutions. Um, she managed money in some of the top situations. She has a great network of people she knows. And she's still begging the Federal Reserve to give her a low cost of capital because she's in a lot of plays like genome, things of that nature. There's going to be a very long time before they can actually return value back to the shareholder from revenue. They're still doing a lot of R&D stuff. Is genome going to be uh, the, the space of the future? Most definitely. But a lot of these companies are going to have to get washed out to figure out what companies can actually come with solutions and what companies can't. So what she's doing is she's just spreading herself across the board and investing in all of them. The problem is that as the cost of capital goes up, it costs more money to put money behind their R&D. So then what is her portfolio going to look like? Right. But see, she doesn't want to just invest in Coca-Cola, invest in uh, uh, Microsoft, invest in Apple because it's hard to differentiate herself. So this is what I want people to understand. I don't want to tell you the amount of money that I made this year, but I kind of gave people a hip, kind of hip people on it. Uh, I want to say maybe three, four months ago It's well over what people going to make over the course of the year. That's just off trading. That's not off selling courses. Right. I don't depend on selling courses to make money. I trade. I'm going to get my money out of the market. The selling courses is ancillary to what I do, because I don't believe that you should depend on people, especially in this environment, to spend money with you. So I really am focused on getting money out of the market. And then there's some other things that I want to do, but I'm just really focused on getting money out of the market because I was waiting for this all last year. And if I would have had more money, I could have made more money. If I would have had the capital, I would have put $50,000 in Carvana puts at two forty five. And I would have just sat back and took my quarter million dollars out of the market. And I just wanted to kick back the rest of the year, right? Because I knew that they couldn't operate in this new environment, right? You're talking about a company since that company has been created. They've had one profitable quarter since that company started, right? One profitable quarter. 
So with all that Ivy League education, with all that access, with all that capital, as long as that company has been operating, they've been profitable one 90 day period. This is why we have to stop buying into that there's something wrong with us. There's something wrong with the way we have been socialized to look at the world. There's nothing wrong with us. Because if they was as good as we have been made to believe, they would perform a lot better. Right? So I don't buy into none of these narratives and none of the people that promote these narratives can sit down with me and actually have a robust conversation about it because they know I will blow them out. They, they can't handle me. That's why they stay away from me because they know what time it is. So that's what I'm looking at. And I'm going to continue. And I might not play anything, but I'm looking at these plays where they're going to be impacted by the hot cost of capital, right? And I don't want to keep Katrina on hold too long. So we're going to go into that. And then when she come off, I'll go into the next part of what I'm talking about. But that's what I want people to understand. I was anticipating the sell-off last year when I saw the 10 year go up and I saw how people responded to that. I'm going to say this and I don't want people to take it the wrong way. You're listening to a lot of quote unquote financial experts. People that quote unquote took tests and had white people say, okay, it's, it's you've been certified by us, right? So Europeans have gave you certification, which is interesting because um, we certified them originally, but now we going to them to cert. But you know, when people tell me what they involved in, I get it. I understand why they think that way, but it is what it is. If they didn't, give you a heads up that this was going to happen after they have all that certification, they passed these Anglo-Saxon tests that said, okay, it's cool for you to speak about these particular topics, right? Or it's cool for you to advise in this area because you passed our test. If they didn't see this coming, I don't understand what they got educated in because to me, the signs were obvious and I'm not a perma bear. I'm not a person that goes on YouTube every day and says the market is getting ready to fall. However, to me, the data points and the indicators that this market was going to sell off were obvious. They were just very obvious. And I was telling people that these indicators are very obvious. And I don't have any of that certification, qualification, pass this test, yada, yada, yada. Right? I just read and I study a lot. Right? And I know what I'm looking at because I know that this is a shell game. So I'm under no illusions that it's a shell game. So one thing about me is when I'm in a game, I know the game that I'm in. I don't have illusions about the game I'm operating in. So because I know it's a shell game and I was I was shown that in 2020. I knew once you put pressure on the game, how people are going to react because they're not able to participate in the facade anymore. Right. So that's what I want people to understand. Let me get Katrina here because I don't want to hold her up because I know people got stuff they're trying to do. Uh, let me get this MVB off of here. Trina, can you hear me? Uh-huh, yes. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. How you doing? I'm doing good. All right, thank you. Happy Juneteenth. Happy Juneteenth to you as well. Okay, all right. So how can I help you? Okay, so um, so like uh, one of the things that you recommend that we do is that we pay attention to what the what the feds are doing. Yes, ma'am. And when they have their little uh when they have their FOMC meetings and reading their minutes and reading their press releases and actually listening to the conference call. Yes, so uh, when you log in to view those, what are three things you listen for? OK, so what I do listen for is just what the overall narrative that they're telling us. So like what is what because what they what they're trying to do now, in my opinion, is they're trying to control the narrative around the market. So what I'm kind of listening for is that what narrative are they trying to communicate to us and then whether or not their policy is in line with that narrative. So the narrative that they, in my opinion, that they came out with around top of the year is that we want, we remember they said they want a soft landing. So they say we want to do a soft landing. Are they still communicating that narrative or do they have a narrative that may be different from that to where they may be what they call more hawkish to where they may raise the rates at a higher rate than, uh, than what is anticipated? Because what you're seeing with the bond market is the bond market is pricing in the schedule of raises, right? So then based on how they perceive the raises being scheduled, then that's kind of setting the rate on bonds and what people are willing to pay for bonds. So that's the first thing I'm looking for. Then I'm looking for any other information based on that may be technical based on how they're perceiving the data and then how they're going to continue to proceed based on that. So if they say that, uh, 
I forgot what rate that they said that they wanted to be neg- at one time they said they wanted to be negative. I think that was the last meeting. I'm sorry, they wanted to be neutral. Mm-hmm. And then they said they wanted that rate to be neutral. Now they're saying that they want that really the rate to be higher than what they originally said. Yeah. Um, there was something else they omitted. I forgot it. I may bring that up. Is that um I think they changed what they wanted the, the unemployment rate to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They yes. have to pick that up. They yes, wanted, ma'am. They was oh, they was okay with it being higher. Exactly. So those are the things I'm looking at. I'm looking at the consistency and their messaging, and then what have they changed? Because I know what they're tr- I know what they they are communicating to me that they're trying to do, but then I'm looking to see are they are their policy changes in line with that, and then also. Um, what do I think they're really trying to do? So I remember like last meeting, he came out, he said that we're going to do a 0.5 on raises. At, at, at this moment, the 0.75 is off the table. And yeah, then we got a relief yeah. rally off of that. Yes, ma'am. But to yeah, me, he was, do- I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. But that's what they said. That's what he said at the last meeting that at the June and July meeting, so they have another meeting next month, that it was yeah. going to be 0.5 in June and 0.5 in July. Yes, ma'am. And to me, that was in line with it being a soft landing. So what I have always believed is that he's trying to softly bring the market down, get the numbers to look halfway decent, and then reverse it. I have no, I don't believe at all that they're going to stick with this plan. Now, some people say that they may change around midterm. Some people say they may change around 2023, but I don't believe they're going to stick with it because I just believe that this particular society and this economy that we're in, is it just needs cheap credit, needs cheap capital. Right. The problem that they have is that because of their monetary policy over the past two years, and you, we talk about this a lot, there's more people, there's more jobs and there are people that are actually want to work the job. Mm-hmm. And the people that are working are getting paid too much. And that's something that he talked about on the last uh, uh, meeting that I need to kind of go through a little bit deeper. But he talked about how he wants the people on the bottom to have more to aspire to pay wise i'm kind of paraphrasing him mm-hmm. what he was kind of saying is that the people on the bottom of society are already making too much money so they got to come up with a policy to kind of bring that pay down and to increase unemployment to where uh they are more likely to take lower paying jobs right in in any area because one of the biggest issues we had is that people left the service sector because they couldn't get jobs because of the pandemic and then they didn't go back into the service sector but we got large amounts of the country where they need people working in those service service oriented positions. Yes. <laughs> so those are the things I'm looking for. I'm looking for one, you know, what are they what are they saying their plans are? I'm look, kind of looking for the same thing I do when I look at a regular earnings call. What are they saying their plans are? Uh are they doing policy that's in line with those plans? Are they changing those plans midstream? And then also, what do I think they're really trying to do? Because, you know, Powell can't come right out and say you know, I'm going to do something that people are going to perceive as negative. You know, he's an attorney, so he knows how to kind of phrase it. Mm-hmm. But he has to kind of spoon feed the market because, like I said, he doesn't want the market to go into a shock because then it will really be detrimental to the U.S. Uh, economy because I think that a lot of these corporations, if they really felt like he was going to get really, really hawkish, they would just start, they would lay people off, but they would lay too many people off. Yeah. And then so then it would be, det- then it would, it would, I wouldn't know if it would create inflation or stagflation, but it'd be detrimental to the economy because we're really based on people buying stuff. So I think he's stuck in a position to where he's trying to bring inflation down, but he doesn't want to crush the consumer. But I don't see how he brings inflation down without crushing the consumer. So yeah. I just I'm just looking to see how he tries to manage that and then to what point, because like I said before, I don't think they go all the way through with this. I know they have a schedule of raises going out to like 2023. But I'm not 100% sure, but I think they're going to do... Didn't they say they was going to do 50 on the next meeting and everyone after that's going to be 25? Well, I was looking at the at the most recent dot plot that came out after with this month's meeting. And what I saw is that they were... They made adjustments upward of what they wanted the GDP rate to be, what they were expecting the inflation rate to be and unemployment rate to be. They adjusted them up and that's, that's why they did the 0.75 now because of that inflation CPI number that came out on the 10th. And they said like, well, I mean, we got to raise it now because it's, it's still going up. <laughs> yeah. So 
that's just the issue. So if if I know we got another CPI print coming out, that may be it. You know, it may be I don't know what their what their uh, expectations are. It may be lower than the last one. So then that may make people feel more optimistic that it's going down because people are now trying to create the narrative that inflation is topped out. If it isn't, they're going to be in trouble. If if the CPI comes out higher or they give us a print that's higher and they may give us a print that's higher to justify the policy. Right. So let's say they give us a print that's higher because I believe that the, the print is actually higher than what they're giving us. But let's say they give us a print that's higher to justify the policy. Then they cannot justify being more hawkish. If they give us something that's in line or lower, it may create a rally. But in my opinion, as we go into the summer months, there's normally a bigger pull on energy because of the summer. More energy costs, more energy usage, which makes energy become more in demand, which raises the price. So then as we go through the summer months, to me, the CPI is going to be higher anyway. So we may get one month of people feeling like we've turned this thing around, but I think we go right back to it. And if we don't have the supply chain issues fixed by that time, I just don't necessarily see the CPI number really starting to go down because I think they said they want inflation to be 2%. I don't know how they get it there. I just don't know how, yeah, I don't know how they get it there. So I don't know what they need to do to get it there. But we one thing that may get it there is we just go into a recession. And then if we go into a recession and people just stop buying, we won't have all those dollars chasing that small amount of goods. So it will bring the inflation rate down. But also as a result, a lot of people will be unemployed. So that may be what they have to do. So I just think they got to figure out because we know now because we've been following them a long period of time. Um, they're not really proactive. They're very reactive. Yes. And so that's the issue is that they don't really try to get out in front of stuff. They kind of trying to wait to see what happens and then they try to deal with it. But the problem is that everything that they're doing is sometimes two or three months behind what's actually going on. Okay. Yeah. So how I mean, how are you seeing it? So, so one of the one of the three things one of the three things I listen for is that I listen to when they do the uh, when JP does the press conference. I look for his opening statement and what he says to the American people. Okay. That seems like that always shows up on the evening news. Yeah. But the rest of the the rest of the comments don't. And then I also listen for what they're talking about around jobs and unemployment and how they're looking to try to move that number up. Okay. Like they dance, they were dancing around it and stuff. But if you look, if you look and see some of the other comments he's made when he's not doing that, you'll see that they're looking, they're okay with the unemployment number being higher. But they still gonna have their jobs. They still gonna be fine. Yeah, definitely. And that's the thing, because you know he just got re, he just got re, what do you call it, reaffirmed. Uh huh. Uh, yeah, reappointed. Yeah, yeah. He reappointed. So he good. He, I think he's good until what the next president. Probably even longer than that. I think yeah. they sit for like maybe four years. Okay, and so he good to go. Yeah. So, so yeah, so that's 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 the thing. So <laughs> just trying to figure out, but I just think um a lot of corporations I think are eventually gonna start asking for the policy to get reversed because I don't think they can operate in an environment with a high cost of capital. Now and we saw a whole bunch of debt, <laughs> exactly, especially carrying a whole bunch of debt. And we saw in 2018 when they tried to raise the rate, the whole market dumped. Now we're seeing that now. So if the, the 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 investment banks feel like, well, you know what, we want to get our policy back, they may decide to just dump the market. What we've done in this time compared to what we did during the pandemic is that it's been very gradual as opposed to very short term. You know, like I showed somebody that video in 2020, you know, you woke up, the market was down, the market dumped 7% on the open, right? Now we're doing a 4% five percent over the course of a day and people are going crazy but during the pandemic you know we lost like 20 something percent over the course of a few days so if they keep selling this thing down that may be how they get piled out of this policy so that's what i want to look for so when i'm looking at my plays i'm making sure that i have enough time on it to where if things change i can get out with my profit Mm -hmm. Because I, like I said I don't think this thing lasts past the middle of the year. It may, but I just don't. I don't think he. I don't think they really want to stick with the policy. Because I don't see how the economy functions with that type of policy. I, I just don't because these companies are getting destroyed, uh, because people's perception is that 
they're not as valuable in this new environment. So that's that's really what I'm looking at. And especially for the companies that that are uh, business to consumer and they fund their purchase it with with credit. But I yeah, know I know one of the things I've noticed is that with my with my car manufacturer, I didn't got like four a, a call every week for the last six weeks after I need service on my car, but I ain't heard from them in like two years. Yeah, I feel <laughs> because people okay. aren't in there buying cars. I'm seeing the car lot starting to fill back up because like if you, if people got to finance the vehicle and that that rate then went up a whole point or whatever, you, you you're not gonna be get as much. Yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs> you gonna have to you gonna have to hold off a little bit, get a little bit of bigger down payment. So I'm. I mean, there's like one of the companies I trade is Ford. Okay. And they have quite a bit of debt. And then they have this their section of the company called Ford Credit. And I'm just, it's not going to look pretty next quarter. Yeah, definitely. Earnings, earnings come yeah, out. Yeah, definitely. And that's, I'm glad you're able to recognize that because a lot of people are not. And so that's the issue is that, you know, how does it impact these consumers where, like you said, is they do business with somebody that needs to get, uh, um, financed to do business with them. And that's why I think like companies like a firm, um, they're pretty much going to be done until they can figure something else out. Uh, other companies like that. And I think that's why Apple created their Apple pay system. to try to deal with that particular situation. So th those are definitely the things I'm looking at. I'm also looking at companies to where they need the financing to run their business. So we have companies to where um, they need financing or, they either got a choice between a finance deal or they're going to, have to do an offering. If they do an offering, they're going to get diluted. They're going to dilute their shareholders. So they may have to do the dilution because the business is being run so bad, they got to raise capital and they don't want to go out into the capital markets and try to get financing because it's going to be too high. It's going to be too expensive for them. So they don't like the deal there. So their attitude is, well, let's just dilute everybody. We saw that with Fresh Pet. They did an a, a offer, I want to say maybe two, three months ago. They're trading at around 56. I think they can still fall. And I think they may have to do another dilution. I don't think they're going to want to go to the capital markets. They pretty much missed every earnings for the past like two years. So those are the kind of things I'm looking at. I just think companies got to try to figure out how to operate because they just, they got addicted to, you know, the cost of capital was like less than half a percent. I mean, it was just so low. It was easy. You know, that money goes to like 20 different banks and then they outlay that money into the markets. And right. so it was just easy money for everybody. And so that's why everybody was making money. In fact, you know, companies that really didn't have a company was getting financed because it was just every, you could just throw anything in the market. And if you could get a return, it was almost like he was getting free money back. Okay. And then the, and the third thing I look for is what isn't said. Okay. Like, especially when the, when the reporters or the media, when they ask certain questions, Sometimes he won't answer the question. He'll talk about something else, but it's like related. But if you're like not listening real close, so I like listen to it at least three times. Okay. To kind of understand and especially focusing on the questions because like sometimes there'll be uh they don't answer all the questions. Yeah. But you can see that everybody has their hand up and they'll pick one and then they'll be like, "This is the last question." Yeah. And like, what about the other people? <laughs> yeah. Well, you, and you I, know, he I only think they're, they're picking questions that are going to be easy to like softballs to hit or whatever. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I, I wonder if before they even have the conference, do they have to turn those questions in? Yeah, I, I, I think they do. OK, OK. So we know that's what we talked about before, about them making sure that they craft that narrative. Yep. You see what I'm saying? So I think that's the issue is that I think they, they those questions are kind of known beforehand. And we know they're only going to do an hour Q&A and then he's out of there because like I saw last time. As soon as they hit an hour, he was gone. <laughs> My he last even, question, I'm out. Yeah, exactly. As soon as he answered that question, he was like, I'm gone. So they timed it real well. So they just have to make sure they keep the, that, that narrative going as to how they're trying to manage this particular market. And it allows Biden to be hands off. So he, he, don't, he don't have to deal with it now because it's all on the Fed. Right. So that's the issue. Other stuff to worry about. Exactly. He got other stuff to worry about. I think they said they was going to do a... Uh, Something with the gas, like a, I don't know. A, a, a gas flat holiday? What yeah, what does that mean? Like? That means that when you buy gas that day, you don't pay taxes? Yeah, I mean, yeah, because a, a portion of what you pay at the pump includes federal taxes for the yes, fuel to put stuff on, to keep, keep the roads, the interstate straight, whatnot. Yes, ma'am. And, and that's one of the things that the that the president can do. He can say, okay, like, okay, so for the next six months, we're not going to collect that. 
Okay, I'm gonna say. And that might bring it down, but I haven't went in to read the rest of the article to kind of see how much that's gonna be per gallon. It's got to be significant for it to make a difference. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so I need to look at that because I saw that today. So I, yeah, so I'm glad you told me that because I'm thinking it was gonna be like a one day deal. I'm like, how are you gonna just do it for one day? Like that's gonna matter. But you telling me it's gonna be a long term. Okay, yeah, that might yeah, work. Yeah, kind of like okay. what they did with the with the social security tax and okay. where you didn't have to pay it. What what if businesses didn't have to pay it or the employees didn't have to pay it to kind of give like back when uh, President Trump was in office. Okay. But only the only only organizations that did it in the, was the Department of Defense and. So, because he was trying to say, that, okay, put more money in the soldier's pocket, but then okay. they had to pay it back. Okay, okay. <laughs> so I need to, I need to, look, I need to look into that because they got to try to figure out some way. Because, like I said, I think once we go into the summer, there's going to be so much of a demand on energy, it's going to get rough on a lot of people, uh, because that's normally when people doing traveling. We know people using a lot of AC, things of that nature, and then even still, we got to roll into the winter after that. Yeah, so, I'd rather have a, I'd rather have a. Not, not so much a gas tax, but the heating and cooling <laughs> tax relief. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. So that's the issue. So they got to try to figure something out. Yeah, so that's what I that's what I seen. So he can be hands off and be like, okay, the Fed has that. But that's normally what I'm looking at. I'm, I'm just trying to see like what are they communicating their policy is. And then what I normally do is that like the next few days, I watch their conference like a few times just to understand it. And then I read out their document a few times just to understand it and to see what they're projecting. Mm -hmm. And then I look to see when they come out and they, cause you see they're speaking a lot. Like they're going to talk all day this week. I'm they're going to talk pretty much every day this week. I see how they're trying to manage the narrative with their conversation, you know, cause they've been doing that a lot lately is everybody comes out, especially after they have a decision and they keep speaking and trying to figure out, okay, what direction are they saying? Cause the market is reacting to it. Mm -hmm. even though I don't think it's as important as the market makes it, but the market does because they got those algos to react to what those people say. Because one of the things that I heard is that because the CPI can number came out on Friday, which is a weird day to release the number. And I heard that the Fed through their media contacts put out the information that they were going to do a 0.75 raise so people could get ready for it. Because what they're worried about is shock in the market. Now, what's interesting is that the Federal Reserve's mandate is not supposed to have anything to do with the stock market. <laughs> but what we've seen over the past few years is that the market and the Fed are like a literally, they're literally in lockstep. Mm -hmm. So, but that's not how it's supposed to be. To, and he's right. going to speak before Congress this week. He, his, his goal is to worry about inflation and unemployment. Mm -hmm. If his policy destroys the U.S. stock market, that's not supposed to be his issue. Because he's supposed to be, it's supposed to be separation of powers and things of that nature. But what we're seeing is that we've now just caught, came out and admitted for people that are actually savvy that their policy really does impact the market because it kind of determines the cost of capital. Yep. And so that's the issue now. So he's very wary of his 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 efforts and how it's going to impact the market. But in reality, he shouldn't be. He should just do his job. And whatever happens in the market, these those particular corporations are supposed to figure it out on their own. They're not supposed to be looking to get accommodative policy out of the Fed, but that's just how it is right now. That's the era that we're in. Yeah. Okay. So I was able to look up the the gas, the 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 federal tax on the gas, and it's yes, eight point three cents per gallon. Okay. But then he would have to get congressional approval. Okay, so you know that'll turn into a whole other issue. So he can't yeah. do an executive order and get it. Mm -mm. Okay. Yes, yeah, so that probably like the, uh, Congress decides what money they're going to collect and who they're going to collect it from. Okay, I feel you. Yes, yeah, so then that, it means that it probably won't happen. So it sounds like a good idea. But if you got to go through Congress, you know, the, the kind of political situation we got inside the United States, it, it probably won't work. So then that's the issue that we probably won't be able to get it done. Because that sounded like a good idea, especially if it's something long term. Because what it'll do is that if it can get more people, uh, you know, just moving around. Because I always felt like if we could lower the cost of energy, it could get the economy running again. It's just a lot of pieces to that. Um, but that admitted that might have been one way to do it. But, you know, maybe he, maybe he can get it through Congress. Uh, everything else he tried has gotten pushed back except for the one COVID bill. Uh, the bill back better didn't go through. But maybe they let this go through. But, you know, it depend on it, do they do just that or do they create a whole package and stuff it full of a lot of stuff and push that through at the same time? 
Yeah, so so if he couldn't get the gas card, they're talking about sending gas cards to everybody. Well, how much? <laughs> well, they, they don't have no numbers for that, but uh, people on his uh, people on his team, he's been doing a lot of asking more questions, go back, do some more research, ask some more questions, go back and do some research. So yep. they're, they're starting to get frustrated because they're still dealing with the student loan of, of forgiveness as well. Yeah, and, so that's uh, yeah, that's the issue. So I mean, gas cars will work, but I mean, they got to figure out what the number is going to be and then how long they're going to do it. So they tell everybody we're going to give you two hundred dollars for gas every every month. You know that works, but to me, my my stimulus numbers is always higher. I always think they should give more. So we'll just see where they come in at that. Because I mean, if they do twenty five fifty a month, I mean it'll help. It's money, but I don't know how much it'll help for people that really got to drive to work every day. Right. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Um, is, is anybody, uh, okay, so is anybody else in the studio? Yes, ma'am. Okay, cool. I'll, I'll come back around. Okay, okay. No, pre appreciate you coming through, though. <laughs> All right. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. So, um, okay, so can you hear me? Yes, sir. How you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing great. How you doing? Doing fine, just cracking the books. I feel you. So what's going on? Not in much. I was just thinking about something. It's just because my mom had been sending me like some some videos basically on like, oh, like um recession, recession talks, all that stuff. Okay. So I've been reading like a macroeconomic book, um, textbook, and I'm like midway through it. And okay. so like from what I was understanding, at least at this point in the book, they were talking about like things that they primarily look to to check to see like what cycle we're in, like GDP. Um, inflation rate unemployment and then so i was trying to like apply that to like the current situation and i just didn't quite see why everyone's getting to recession talk so fast but what i really want to ask is what happens like does does how you operate as a trader even change in a recession like or does it stay the same which is with more research and whatnot in the markets okay so let me ask you a question we say how you operate what do you mean by that so like um I, I remember you saying like sometimes if you don't really know what's going on in the market, you just got to stay out the market and paper trade. Like does like the fundamentals or like of the market kind of shift a little bit like in a recession type, in a recession situation. Like you might, um, I'm trying to think how I want to put it. Cause I'm not talking about like you changing your rules per se, but I don't, I don't, I'm trying to think of the best words to, to really say what I want to say. Okay, so let me give yourself a, a, a second, because first, how do you define a recession? Do you mean six months of next? I'm um, six months of negative GDP. Uh, a two quarters of a negative GDP print. That's how you define a recession. Let's say that. Let's say two quarters. Okay, so if I get two quarters of a negative GDP print, would that change the way in which I trade? Is that the question? Yes. No. But I mean, I don't see what that have to do with the principles of how I operate. So if I have an mm -hmm. SOP, uh, as, as far as how I trade, or I have a trading plan. Okay. Uh, yeah. Two negative quarters of a, a recession wouldn't change that. Okay. As far as the actual SOP or the actual principles in which I trade. So let's say I say um, I uh, manage risk uh, at this particular level. Mm -hmm. I may change the risk management level, but I wouldn't stop managing risk. Okay, that make, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I mean, that, that was my main thing. I was just trying to figure out like whether that that element changes or not. Because, like, I mean, I know that you said like some at times like stay away from certain companies if you really don't know the industry. Like, for example, I was like in Alibaba for a while, yeah. and I took a lot of profits, but then I also took some losses because I didn't really understand how deep the situation was or how much news will be released with the frequency. So let me ask you a question. So what made you attracted to Alibaba? Um, what made me attracted? I think, what was it? What was it? I think it was at a point when it had, um, I had been, I normally use like a volume indicator. Like if I see like mm -hmm. a really high volume on mm -hmm. like, on like a high buy-in on a stock, I'll go in and start doing heavy research on that stock. 
Okay. And so after I had done some heavy research or I had done what I felt like was pretty good research, I was feeling pretty comfortable on it being in a put situation. Okay. And so the first time, first two times I um, put, placed puts on it, I came out pretty profitable. But then the last most recent time I took a put on it, I came out negative. But that's more so because I bought plenty of time, but I didn't want to hold, I guess, long enough once again for it to return because I want to put my money other other places. Okay. So, I mean, um, mm -hmm. I still stick to, in my opinion, I wouldn't trade anything. I don't, and I'm not saying I don't make mistakes, mm -hmm. uh, but the core amount of the majority of my success has come from trading tickets. I really knew what was going on. So that's just me personally. So that's why I really encourage people to do that um, is to, become an expert on a, at least one company, but maybe up to five and not jump around. Uh, and then I think once you get into that habit, it's easier to find opportunity in the market, but you're not jumping. Most people are taught, especially through a lot of day trading programs, is to look at technical indicators and that determines what they trade that day. Well, nobody on Wall Street trades like that. Nobody that works for a firm trades like that. That's that's uh, stuff that's been created by course creators because most people want to get to the trading as fast as possible. But the way in which I've been allowed, I've been able to help people have success is to get them to focus on specific things and to become experts on that. And then you're able to identify the opportunity in that because you know it. So to me, if you don't understand, in my person, I'm talking about you personally, but I'm just saying in my opinion, if you don't really want to understand the government in China, I wouldn't trade anything dealing with China because that's driving everything in China. No, I, I mean, definitely get that. I mean, I took that time because I because I watched that video about what like the fact that you're kind of on like a shell company. And that's what made, led yeah, me. Yeah, to you, it's no kind of it's no kind of you do on a shell company. Yeah. Like there's, there's no kind of in there. You own a shell company uh, that's normally going to be listed in the in the in the uh, islands and you don't really own any equity in the company. You don't own anything in China. So you just, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be, I'm not opposed to trading it. Um, I definitely wouldn't try to own it. And I do own to be full disclosure. I own a little bit of Neo, but I just own a little bit. Mm -hmm. Neo's not going to make me rich. You know, I just own a little bit. So I'm not here to tell you, you did the wrong thing. You know, you did what worked best for you at your, in your situation. But I really encourage people before they start trading something, because this is how I've been able to help people have success is to really know what they're trading. Not halfway know it, not be kind of familiar, just really know it. So like I made a lot of money off Carvana this year. I spent a lot of hours studying Carvana. When I know the used car game real well, and I spent a lot of time studying that. So then when I started trading it, I knew what they were telling me on the earnings calls was BS because I, I know exactly, like I know what company I'm dealing with. And I knew they were lying to me on earnings calls. And I knew that their acquisition of, I think it's Odessa, it wasn't going to save that company because I knew the company. So that's just how I've been able to help people have success. But I don't down talk what nobody else does. But I just try to really make sure I really know what I'm trading uh, on a very deep level. And I encourage people to become an expert on at least one company. Okay. Well, um, that's, that's really all I want to ask. Okay. I appreciate it. No problem, man. Take it easy. Be safe. Same to you. All right. So we got any more uh, questions? So GS9 asks, is Neo a shell company? Um, it depends on how you define shell company, but when you buy a uh, stock in Chinese companies, you don't own equity in those companies. You can't own anything in China. It's illegal. So I don't care about Munger or Ray Dalio. Ray Dalio runs money for the Chinese. So he's going to say what he needs to say. Right? He runs money for them. Uh, but you can't own anything in China. It's illegal. Right? So they they you buy into uh, I don't know. I forgot what you call it. Companies that are really based out of the Caribbean through some type of legal process. And I mean, it, it tracks their stock price, but you can't own anything in China. It's illegal. You're a foreigner. And they real funny about that. 
America, you know, you can come right off the boat and start buying stuff in America. America's for sale. So we got any questions. The link is in the uh, the link is pinned. If you want to come through and ask something, let me know. We have the 45 minute mark. What do I think about starting a solar business? I would speak to uh, Miss Erica Williams. She may be able to give you some insight on that. And I would, if I was serious about it, I would pay her for a consult. She may be able to help you in that area. I would pay her for a consult because she knows people that have been successful in that space. And she could probably fast track you uh, as far as what you need to do to be successful in that space. Because she's out here in Texas. Solar is real, real big out here. Because of the sun, so much sun here is ridiculous, and it don't never rain. So solar is real big out here. So if you were really serious about that, I know a guy that was doing that in Florida too, out of Homestead, uh, but I don't talk to him anymore. But if you're really serious about that business, I would reach out to her and pay her her uh, consultation fee, and she could probably fast track you in that particular area uh, around solar. Because I know she's spoken to that a few times. That's not really my thing uh, as of yet. So here's some questions. How can a call and a put with the same strike price and expiration date have a both a negative percentage change? I don't know. It's going to be based on the implied volatility and the uh, the shell price movement. I would need to see the chain before I uh, made a comment on it. Have I played an option on the stock split? What strategy use to complete the option? Uh, I haven't played it. I, I had played it, but I didn't hold it after it split. I think after it splits, they just reset your options based in line with the split but i've never i never bought an option on the split made a mistake on that though it's a guy named tone he in the dr now he was telling me to buy tesla calls going out like two years and about six months later they split but i i just i didn't see it he saw it let me let uh mr jeffrey in how you doing how you doing sir uh I'm going to get straight to it. You might have covered this already. If you did, I apologize. But uh, when you're determining how far out to set your expiration date on these stock options or whatever, mm -hmm. what do you use to determine, you know, how far out or not? You know, what type of data or metrics? or? Well, one thing I try to do as a rule, and, and I tell people that until they really get savvy, is to try to buy expiration data out as far as possible. Okay. Because normally what you see with IV is when you hit the midpoint of your contract. So let's say you get a, let's say in this example, we get a two week contract. Normally, once you hit that midpoint of the contract, you're going to start dealing with a lot of IV crush. Okay. So if you don't get the expected move before you hit the midpoint, you're going to get IV crush really hard. And then now you need even more of an extreme move in that direction to defeat that IV crush. Because then the market maker says, well, if they haven't, if we haven't hit the, the expected move by midpoint of the contract, it's very unlikely we're going to hit it. Now, can things change over that midpoint? Yes, but it's very unlikely. And it's more extreme the shorter the contract. So if I get a two-week contract, the IV crush at midpoint would be more extreme than if I get a yearly and the IV crush at the six-month. Okay. So what I tell people to do as a rule until they get experience and they've kind of seen enough option scenarios and they kind of know how the market moves is to get an expiration date out as far as possible and if you can't afford it, if you cannot afford an expiration date as far as possible, then maybe you don't need to buy that contract. Mm, okay. And so that, that's how I played until I get experience. And then you start to understand based on the IV, based on the scenario that I think is going to happen. So what do I think is going to cause the, the actual expected move? What time span do I think that's going to happen in? And then what I normally try to do is buy more time than that. So okay. if I think something's going to happen over the next 90 days, I try to buy more time than that, just in case it don't happen. Then I don't get IV crush and I can exit at a loss, but I don't get as much. Because if you don't get the expected move within the midpoint of that contract, and I mean if it, I don't mean if it goes in the opposite direction, I mean if it trades sideways or it trades within a tight range. If you get a reversal in the opposite direction and you're getting short, you're going to get an IV crush, that contract's going to get wiped out. Okay. Now, what do you mean by IB or IV? Implied volatility. 
Okay, implied yeah, volatility. implied volatility. So uh, implied volatility rules are forecasted expected move. You can go look at the statistical data for that. They got a statistical formula that you can look at to try to determine what the expected move is. We got uh, uh, platforms now that can tell you like what is your break even strike price when you buy the contract. Okay. So you got like I think Tasty Trade does that as part of their risk analysis. So when you're looking at the contract, it can tell you at that particular point based on all the Greeks what what needs to be your break even so where does the share price need to be for you to just break even on the contract so you don't even have to do the formulation anymore they do it for you okay. but the implied volatility is the forecasted move the thing about options contracts is your move has to be greater than the anticipated move for you to cash out you don't want your move to be in line or less than the anticipated move so that's what hurts a lot of people is that they really don't a lot of times really understand the scenario they buy the contract they don't get the anticipated move and the contract gets crushed and they kind of don't know what happened because the goal is about we're playing a game of options mispricing i'm looking to buy contracts that i believe are mispriced because the market maker made a mistake on pricing the contract if i believe the market maker priced the contract correctly i don't want to buy it right right because there's no value in it for me so it's like a person saying I know I can sell fruit at this fruit store for two dollars an item. I don't want to buy it from the grower at two dollars an item. I need to buy it for fifty cents. Right, right. So if the okay. grower is telling me I'm charging two dollars an item, there's no sale because I can't take it to the market and sell it. I'm just gonna break even on the price. I don't make. In fact, I lose money on that. Right. So, so what? You're not we, looking to get it for retail. No, I'm looking to get it mispriced. That's why I did that video when I showed you uh, Rothstein. Rothstein okay. understood that the line that the that the line maker had made a mistake with the line. Okay. So then he was he was able to go place a bet because he realized that the bookie or the lines maker made mistakes because their job is to generate um action on that particular game. So he looks for inaccuracies in their line making. It's the same thing. I had somebody that took my course that used to work, I think, in maybe Atlantic City, but they worked in the game industry. They told me that this is nothing but handicapping, and it is. So right. what I'm looking for is the market maker, based on my analysis of the situation, the market maker has mispriced this contract. And therefore, because I believe that the situation is going to change, as then they once they reset the pricing, the contract becomes more valuable and I sell the contract back to the market. So do you have an entry point in mind before you even look at the look at the purchase of the contract or when you say entry point? What do you mean? uh like uh the price you want to buy the the contract you know what i mean do you already have that in mind or do you calculate that some kind of way or do you you mean like the price at which i want to purchase the contract yes sir yeah i mean i just go look at the options chain because that already gives me all the prices so i know oh, i know okay. my budget i know how much money i got in my account i know how much money i'm willing to spend in my account okay and i just go look at the options chain and it shows me what prices are being offered at that particular time so if the price is based on the market, what they're charging, IV, I determine then and there if I feel like these contracts are mispriced in my favor. Okay. Right? I don't care what anybody else is doing. Is it mispriced in my favor based on my analysis? If it is, it may mean a buy. It may not. So what I teach people is you should look for any reason not to buy the contract. <laughs> you should look for a reason to buy. You should look for any reason not to buy it. And then if you Based on your criteria, it's, like, it's five reasons why I would buy the contract. Right. If any one of those don't hit, that means don't buy it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, man. Well, that's that's all I had to uh, ask you. I appreciate your time, sir. No problem. Take it easy. All right, now. All right. So let me go through the other questions. We got any other questions? Let me know. The um, the what you call it is in the is pinned in the chat. So you saw Rivian, definitely. They don't have any money in the bank. They weren't driving any revenue. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. They, it, uh, Mr. Montgomery, I don't know how they run their business because the word is out that they overpay for everything. So once the car market softens, I don't know how it's going to work for them, but I, in my opinion, they, they they're going to they're going to go bankrupt and they're going to borrow their cars back for pennies on the dollar. That's what I think the play is. I don't know. I never thought for a minute the play was to run a successful company. 
the investors, the, the father and the son have been able to cash out as billionaires. They can run this thing in the bankruptcy, go back and buy the inventory back in pennies on a dollar once they restructure. Because the word is out that they overpay for everything. So they're overpaying. The car market is getting ready to soften. Um, they try to do an offer. It didn't work at the price they wanted. They had to change the offer. But once the car market softens, all that inventory that they overpaid for, I mean, it's just going to bite them in the butt. But, you know, it is what it is. They, like I said before, is that they're trying to force that into bankruptcy. And it's legal. They're not doing anything illegal. I just wouldn't want to own their stock. How do I understand the financial statements? Mr. Bylon, what I do is I go to the financial statement. I look at it item by item and I just Google what it means. Right. Because most accounting statements are. Uh, are like the same regardless of the company. So all I do is just look at a You can go to Yahoo Finance and look at their statistics, look at their basic accounting statements and just Google what it means. And you, it's going to be easy to look it up because most of the uh, the accounting statements are pretty much going to be the same regardless of the company, regardless of the industry, yada, yada, yada. You do get some that's going to be specific to a particular company or industry. But for the most part, probably 75, 80 percent of it is going to be identical as far as what's going to be included in the statement. And that's pretty much that's the easy way to learn it. Or you can go to your community college, pay them like, I don't know, a few hundred dollars and take just a basic managerial accounting class or basic financial principles of financial accounting. In 90 days, you'll have a much better understanding of accounting than like 99% of the population. Yeah, look at uh, what's the guy's name? The Asian dude. Forgot his name. But, you know, the market is going to be bullish. So they'll get back because the market is designed to be bullish. But right now they can't, you know, they can't find anything to talk about. So they're just going to keep predicting the market is getting ready to turn around. So, Mr. Atkinson, I will Google to figure out what publicly traded companies are going to benefit uh, or suffer. It would be detrimental to their business. That 12 trillion of gold. My question is, has anybody verified that this 12 trillion of gold in Uganda? Has that been verified? I've seen it on the Internet, but has it been verified? Because how did they determine this 12 trillion? How come it's not like 11.5 trillion? So how do we verify that, that it's 12 trillion? And then what is it going to cost to extract it? What if it costs 300 trillion to get it out of there? What's the ideal platform? Uh, I would just try something and see how it works. Right. I don't promote any platform. I don't have a, a, a affiliate. I would just try something to see how it works and just make sure when you I will call them. And make sure before I fund it, I will call and make sure I can pull my money out of there. Because I heard people have issues getting their money out of Robin Hood as far as transferring their stuff over. So I will call and make sure I can do that. So, Miss uh, Adele Asar, I appreciate the $10. I really do. So let me get down to the bottom. Yeah, def yeah I saw that too. You know, so I think they bought, I want to say three, four days ago. They bought, um, they bought at a little bit of a higher price. I think they're doing that just to make it look good. Because they they so caked up off of that now, they can throw 30, 40 million back into the market and just flush it down the toilet. It don't matter. They're going to walk away even bigger billionaires than what they started. So like I said, I think they sat down with their lawyers and they figured out how to make this look a certain way to where they can't go to prison for it. But that's all they're doing, in my opinion. You know, because everybody knows they overpay for cars. So when the word is out, I don't know like what they're doing. Like they're not trying to really maximize profit on any level. Uh, Cause I always thought the car game was the buy low, sell high. Um, but you know, they might know something I don't know. And then that Odessa deal, you know, I just don't get it. But like I said, is I'm not hundred percent convinced at all that they're trying to run a real business. They just trying to uh, get money out of the public markets, which is the game. So GS9 says Germany is the number one country with rest of all most impact in the world. Germany's been getting to use coal again. Um, so I would ask myself, are there publicly owned companies that service oil and gas in Europe? I read that about Germany starting to use coal. 
And I would also ask myself, when we go into the winter, are they going to stick with it? Right? But that Russian gas is going to get sold to somebody. They're not going to destroy it. Somebody's going to buy it. Uh, there was an article I read, and I was going to talk and do a video on it. There's firms that have put businesses, I think, in Asia to sell that Russian oil and gas. So it's going to get sold to somebody because they're not going to destroy it. It's a resource. Right? Therefore, I want to see, because I think like to transfer to an alternative source takes like 50 years, right? So like, I don't see where the usage is going to go. It can get there, but it's going to just take a long time. It's not going to happen overnight. So what I want to see is that what they need it, will it happen? So Miss Alexander, I saw that. I just thought, I think it was profit taking. Um, it had ran up for so long. And so aggressively, I think people are just taking profit. So we want to see when we open up this week, because it was Red Friday. We want to see when it opens up this week, how does it perform? But I just think it was profit taking. That's one thing about being bullish is you got to deal with a lot of profit taking. You know, normally it'll run up. People will take profit. It'll form a base. It'll run back up again. Because normally on bull runs, what I've experienced is a lot of profit taking. So in my opinion, it was profit taking. Um, but let's see over the course of like, let's say the next, you know, 30 to 90 days where it goes. But I saw that on Friday, but it run up for, it didn't run up. Cause I'll be real with you. I was buying XOM during the pandemic for $40 and I wish I had money to buy more. And people like Kathy Wood saying that we're all going to be $15. I'm like, okay, yeah, I believe you. I just kept buying as much as I could. I wish I could have bought more. Really. I should have been buying a, a oil ETF, but I know better now. So it had run up so much. I just think now people are looking to take profit. But let's see. Um, does it form a base? Does it drop back down to a, a, a support level? Because I haven't really charted out because I don't trade oil. I just buy XOM. Big fan of XOM. They pay a dividend too. I don't, you know, I don't see why people was bearish on it. It don't make no sense. That man running a good company over there. He need to keep doing what he's doing. And he said he's not going to increase supply. So he's playing it real smart. So you think oil is going to go back up? Yeah, definitely. So let's see how it goes. You know what I'm saying? Let's see how it goes. I was looking at calls let two weeks ago when XOM going out to uh, first of the year at the money. You know, so that's the thing. But I'm just, I'm going to watch it. I may not trade it at all. I may just keep watching it and keep trying to buy it. Yeah, definitely. It takes a long time to build up. I think they want to do nuclear. It take a minute to build that. Like it just takes a long time to transition to other stuff because we build all that infrastructure based on, because what are they going to do? Like they're going to just disregard the pipeline that they used. They got one pipeline to bring uh, gas into from Russia to Germany. They was going to build another one. And that's really what the United States had an issue with was that they don't like that. So they're going to just disregard all that. You know, it is what it is. If you study, the CIA's been mom on this whole thing because to me, they're the ones behind all of this anyway. See, they ain't heard nothing from them since this whole thing started because to me, they're behind all of this. Appreciate it, uh, lovely mind. I appreciate it. Miss uh, Lady L, you got to depends on what your analysis, in my opinion, I would ask myself, what is my analysis for it over the next 12 to 24 months? Right? Um. So I would ask myself, what is my analysis on oil over the next 12 to 24 months? And then where do I think it is going to go? Is it hitting all time highs now? And then what do I think demand will be on oil the next 12 to 24 months? No price is going to go up forever. Um, and we're always going to see normally on bull runs, you're going to get profit taking. People are going to just take profit because they made so much money because there were people buying XOM in the 30s and the 40s. So they're getting ready to get their money out of that deal now. Yeah, I believe that. I believe that 100%. Do I believe housing costs will go will drop? Well, drop is relative. So housing costs can drop by 3%. And that's a drop. But it may not be enough drop to make a difference for somebody looking to buy a house. Right? So a house can go from being worth $300,000 to being worth two eighty. dollars And I mean, that $20,000 might do it for somebody else. But for somebody else, it might still be $80,000 too expensive. 
So those are the things that I think we need to consider. So the question is, how much will it drop? Will it drop in comparison to how much it's gained over the past two years? Because housing went on a run over the past two years, like crazy runs. I seen housing that was worth 180, not going for 360. So we got any questions before we get up on out of here? We got the 105. So um, Adeli Islar, Miss Islar, this is what I want you to do. My uh, Instagram is in the channel page. Just hit me up on Instagram. And I hopefully, if you got an Instagram, hopefully your Instagram avatar or ID is the same as your YouTube name. And I'm going to give you the uh, the free gift, the free giveaway. Right? And then, um, what's the other dude name? Adrian Jeffrey. Hit me up on Instagram. And I'm going to give you the other free giveaway. So I'm going to give two out. So those are two people. Yeah, we got to see. You know, I'm going to just sit back and watch it. I don't think they're going to increase production either. So the free giveaway is uh, I got free classes with chastity. So she got an options training uh, course. She teach more of the shorter term trading. So I got free classes with her, right? So I'm gonna I'm give that to her. I'm gonna give that to them, and you know they can work they can work that situation. I just got to get the information through Instagram because I don't want them putting their email up here. They might get a million emails, so they just got to reach out to me on that, and I'm gonna link them with Chastity. And then we could take it from there. You know what I'm saying? So we're gonna we gonna do it on that level. No problem. Yeah, so just hit me. No problem, man. Appreciate you coming through. Appreciate the question because it allowed other people to kind of understand it. People ask that question a lot. So that's the goal is to really um uh really try to help people get an understanding. And we did it because it was Juneteenth. I didn't even know this was a real holiday. I had always heard of it, but I didn't even know it was a real holiday. So appreciate it, Julani. So heads up. So one thing that we're trying to do with the course is to just get you an understanding of the uh, of the markets, right? And so options really can be a, a door that you open into that you continue to go into. Because if you see what like Katrina, other people, the conversation is a little bit different than maybe what you're normally used to hearing on YouTube. And so with some of the people that have taken my course and have been successful as, as an options trader, so what they didn't do was they didn't take the course and start jumping around. They took the course and got success in the course and then used it as a as a foundation to build up. So one of the people that had a lot of really, really success in my course, what they were doing today while everybody else is doing what they're doing, and we're not down on nobody, people got a right to enjoy themselves and enjoy their life. I'm never... Uh, one of them kind of people that feel like, oh, you know, you should never enjoy yourself. Enjoy yourself. Life is short. So make sure you enjoy yourself because you can be out of here at any time. You never know. But while a lot of people was doing what they was doing, um, they was paper trading the futures markets. And I told them, you're going to make a million dollars as a futures trader. It is not that you can't make a million dollars as an options trader, but the futures trader, because of the leverage that you can take on, you can take on way more leverage than you can take on in the options market. So once they figure out the futures market, they really going to make a lot of money. But they got their start in the options game, right? And that's what I want people to understand. This is about foundation. You know, when they talk about a pyramid, you build the base first and you build up. A lot of people never build their base. They just try to jump around from thing to thing to thing. And there's nothing wrong that if you feel like, well, this don't work for me. Ain't no wrong with that. Like, there's no wrong with changing the job. But what I really, really encourage you to do is try to figure out somewhere where you can build your base, get success in that base, and then build up from there, right? As opposed to, because I was really successful as a trader, trading leaps and trading swing before I ever looked at short term. 
Some people may do it vice versa. They may start off short term and go longer. Right. I was really good at fundamental analysis before I ever looked at technical analysis. I used to trade just off fundamental. I never, I didn't know how to read a chart. Didn't know nothing about candlesticks, none of that. I just knew fundamental analysis. That's why me, I still go back to fundamental. I just add a little bit of technical in. Right. But that's why when people talk to me, they confuse me if they don't know fundamental because I don't know what you're trading because they can't really talk to technicals and then they don't know the fundamentals. And that's why they don't have. To me sustain success in the market because they don't really know what they're trading on a fundamental level right so i built that foundation then i built started looking at technical getting with people like lance and learning the technical game and then mixing the two so that's what i want to really encourage people to do is that there's going to be people that came through my program that down the the lane they might be trading real estate paper they might be trading crypto they might be trading whatever but they came through here, which was always the goal, right? To get you to come through here, get you the fundamental, get you your platform, and then have you build up off of that. But like I said, Mecca was very successful as an options trader before she ever started doing anything else, right? So was uh, so was Chastity. Chastity was successful as an options trader before she did anything else, right? She didn't just bounce around, right? Just trying every little thing under the sun. She got successful. And then she built up off of that. And so that's what I want people to really understand is that that's what we're trying to do here is get you that success level. Then you build up. And like I said, options may not work for you, but I want to really encourage people to stick with something. No matter what they do, get that success, because a lot of people spend their whole life just going from thing to thing to thing to thing. And they never find no success. Then they let people tell them that everything is a scam, but you ain't stick with nothing. Only thing you stuck with was jumping around. So everything may not be for you. That's I understand that some things have not been for me, right? A lot of people try MLMs and realize that's not for them. I get it. The people that's making a lot of money MLMs, they stayed in them though, right? I know a woman that make big money MLMs. She's been in MLMs 30 years. So that's why she's so good at it. But I want to really encourage people to try to find something as we start going into this economic situation that we really getting ready to go into. And to find something they think they can be good at and just stick with it and get, get a success story out of it. Because that'll be a lot that'll allow you to create a plant a foundation to build up off of, and then it'll spring you into different areas of life because you got that foundation. Right? So let me answer this question. We're gonna get up on out of here. What's your premises? Day trading. So, what's your preference since day trading scalping? ETFs, I don't understand the question. So if you could rephrase the question, I appreciate it. I don't really understand the question. I want to answer something I don't understand. Okay, so it just got passed the national holiday. I didn't know. Yeah, definitely. And it will. You know, and I think people understand that. You know, if, if you really start to understand these markets, you're not just handing somebody your money and just hoping that they do the right thing with it. You know, you just not. And that's kind of how we've been programmed to conduct ourselves. And then when it go wrong, we don't know what happened because I know people I don't recommend this to anybody. I don't make investment recommendations, but I know people that because they were really savvy about the markets. They they pulled all their money out of the out of their 401k. It just went cash and they're going to go back in at a later date. That's not a recommendation. I wouldn't recommend that to anybody. But they was able to do that because they really understood the markets. Right. That's not investment advice. I can't give you investment advice. Right. So that's what I want people to understand is that when you really understand these spaces, you know how to navigate them. You're not just socking your money to somebody else and then they just paying you a management fee and all they're doing is buying the S&P 500 anyway. Appreciate it, Mr. Montgomery. I appreciate your feedback on Carvana. Yeah, definitely. She, she knows her stuff too. She really does. So do I prefer in index of individual tickers? Uh, I prefer individual tickers because I can look into their financials and get the story that they're telling me. With an ETF, to me, it's harder to learn every company in the ETF, right? So because one thing I was able to do, and I talked about this on Sunday, is I was able to find companies to be bearish on in a bull market. So that's why when the market went bearish, it was easy for me, 
right? Because when everybody was talking about everything going to the moon, I was able to find companies to be bearish on because I was able to look into their financials and you know what they was going on. And I started linking up with a lot of guys that do short reports and things of that nature. So I got really into companies because I started doing fundamental analysis. And so to me with ETFs, it's harder because I would want to look at all those companies in the ETF, which increases a lot more study time as opposed to just looking at one company. So if I'm trading five companies, I'm studying five companies. But if I'm trading four companies and one ETF, they got five companies in it. Then in my mind, I got to study nine companies. So I would I, I just didn't, wouldn't want to spend that kind of time because I would want to know, like, what is every especially based on how it's weighted? What is going to be the companies that are going to be driving the ETF and what's going to be the company that's going to cause the ETF to sell off? We see that with a lot of the art ETFs. Once Tesla started doing bad and Teladoc started doing bad, it was over for those art ETFs because she essentially she just essentially stacked all her ETFs with Tesla. Right. Like she was doing something. But that worked till it didn't work. Right. You know, that worked real good till it didn't work. And what they're supposed to do is they're supposed to rebalance, but they're not doing that, right? Which is just, you know, because they don't know what else to go do. It's supposed to rebalance the ETF, but they're not doing that. They're just keeping everything consistent. So I guess you feel like it's going to bounce back. She's going to beg for monetary policy long enough until they give it to her. Okay, so short term, I'm looking at the SPY. But I'm paper trading the SPY. I did some live trades on that last week i got like 20 percent over the day really 10 percent on each trade um i do i do uh what you gonna call it so i do i'm still gonna keep paper trading the spy so i'm not in any rush to learn how to do it right i'm not in a rush right because i'm i'm really solid on long-term stuff but i'm not in a i'm not in a rush to do it because it, it'll come to me if i just stick with it long enough uh thursday was a reason why I didn't need to live trade it because it was so volatile Thursday. I would have just lost a lot of money. So I know I don't know what I'm doing. So I'm not going to put myself in a bad position because I know I don't know what I'm doing. I still got to learn it. So it, I'm going to just keep doing a lot of paper trading, paper trading, paper trading. But um, I took education from chastity on how to trade the spy. So I just got to keep reinforcing that. So I'm going to take what she taught me and add in what I already know about trading. And then just keep pushing. So on, on short term, it's the SPY. And the reason why I like the SPY, because it's very liquid. Uh, the volumes are there. So you don't necessarily on the daily have to buy right at the money all the time. Right. If you get a directional move, it increase the premiums and you can just exit. And the one thing I do like about the SPY, as soon as I buy it, on the times I did trade it live, I can set my sale and I don't even have to watch it it'll just sell off under those conditions because the spy moves uh so rapidly what i do like about the spies it trades within a range you just got to know the range once you figure the range out you know exactly which direction it's gonna go and then chastity gives you really good rules to trade under right and if you just follow those rules you can put yourself in a really good position to be successful there's no guarantees because it's the market but most people in my opinion um don't want to admit they don't know it so they get in there and they're just gonna get chopped up because the people that are trading the spy they professionals these are not lightweights in that market you in the market with jp morgan and goldman these professionals so you got to really know what you're doing and i'm willing to admit and when it comes to the spy and, and short-term trading i don't know what i'm doing so what i need to do is sit back and paper trade it until i get my routine down and then i can so I may run a live trade here and there, but I'm going to do way more paper trading. Uh, you can reach out to Chastity. So her video is on my uh, YouTube with her contact information in there. So you can reach out to her. It's uh, No Better Do Better on Instagram. I believe that's the name of her company. It's No Better Do Better. But understand now she, you know, she just as serious about this stuff as me. Right? So just know what you get yourself into. So we got any questions before we get up on out of here? Yeah, definitely. She retired off the spot. Definitely. Right. And she wanted, and I got her, uh, got a module with her in the VIP, teaching people how to trade it. Right. So it is what it is. It has been lately because of volatility. 
but it also depends on what a lot of people like about the spies. You get three times, you get three expiration dates during the week, and you can't get that on a, a, a normal ticker. So that's a benefit of the spy. You get three expiration dates, right? Um, so that's that's the thing. So that's why a lot of people like it. And I know guys on Twitter, they do zero day expiration trades on spy every Friday. They figured out how to do it. I don't know how to do it, and I'm not going to try. But they make money like they make money doing that. They do zero day expiration. They do they every they trade this by every Friday. That's how they make their money. And just it is what they do. I'm a believer that you can trade anything if you dedicate yourself to it because everything got a pattern, right? Um, and you just wait for your pattern. But most people don't want to wait. They just gotta do it, you know. And that's how they get caught up. And then they you know they just get washed out of the market. The guys that I know that trade intraday. If they don't get they set up, they don't trade. So the problem with a lot of people is that they're so desperate to make the money, they can't wait for the setup. So the people that I know that are successful trading intraday, they're not waiting for your setup. They're not waiting for my setup. They're waiting for their setup. And if they don't get they set up, they don't trade. And they're willing to wait for their setup. Right? Because that's all algos do. Algos trade off of a setup. So algos have been programmed to wait for a certain condition to execute a trade. And the algo just waits. Right? So that's why people shouldn't be scared of algos. Algos do what we should do. The algo waits for their setup. They wait for their condition. And then once the condition exists, they trade. If they don't get the condition, they don't trade. Right? So back when Trump was doing his thing, you had algos waiting for Trump to say something. And if they Trump didn't say something, they didn't trade. A human being knows they're supposed to wait for a setup, but they so anxious to want to trade, they disregard the setup and trade anyway. That's why computers beat humans. Because the computer's so stupid, it won't trade until it gets the setup, unless it's a malfunction in the program. Right? So that's why everybody's going to automation. Because humans are so smart, they violate their own protocols. You know what I'm saying? So that's just the issue. So the guys I know that make a lot of money, they've dedicated themselves to it. They risk management is another level. That's something else Mecca's really good at is risk management. And she taught that in the VIP. Her risk management is on another level, right? And she's almost uh, like a computer with it. And she understands her setups and she just trades her setups. Chassis does a thing, same thing. Chassis trades her setups. Everybody I know that makes a lot of money trading intraday, they wait for they set up. They not wait for somebody else's set up. They wait for they set up. And I know a lot of people that lose money. They're waiting for somebody else's set up, not they set up. You got to figure your own setup. And once you learn your setup, you just trade your setup. And your setup may come once a week. You trade once a week then. Once you get your percentages down, I'm talking about from my own pers my own perspective, not giving investment advice. Once you get your percentages down, or your dollar amount down based on how you see the market, then you increase your position size. So I know a guy on Twitter, he'll pull like eight, nine thousand dollars a day out of the out of the spy because he does big position size, right? But he didn't start off like that. But that's what he does now. He'll pull seven, eight thousand a day out of the spy, but he just waits for a setup. And if he don't get the setup, he won't trade. So like he didn't trade that Thursday where it sold off. He didn't trade because his setup wasn't there. So I just think that's what most people struggle at is they learn technical stuff, but they don't have the discipline to wait for their setup and to say, well, you know what? Today just wasn't my day to trade. They got to make a trade. And I sometimes have that issue. I've gotten a lot better at just not trading that day. Right? It just, it just ain't my day. Because normally when I take a flyer on a ticker, I lose money. Like I lost money on Sark. Right? Or I lost money on a DWAC, right? I didn't really know DWAC like that, but I just, it was a casino play, lost money on it. Everything that I really put a lot of time and money and energy in, I normally do well, or I'm able to really minimize my loss. Because as soon as it don't go in the direction I needed to go, I just able to cut it because I know what's going wrong. A lot of times people that don't put their time into it, they hold on to the trade too long because they're too caught up in the trade having to go right. That's why they lose money. Right. So that's what I want people to really understand is that the guys that I know or the women that I know that make it on shorter time spans, 
is they look for they set up. And if they don't get they set up, they don't act. They just like an algorithm. An algorithm is looking for a specific market condition to either buy or sell at a certain price point. If they don't get it, they don't act. That's why two years ago in that video, we came out and the market dropped 7% at the open. Why? Because the algos didn't get the uh, ass condition they wanted to buy. So because they didn't get that ass condition, they wouldn't buy any shares. So what happened? The price just kept falling. So that's the issue is that if people started to really understand how algorithms were configured and they have the discipline to trade the same way, I think they would be a lot more successful. That's why we put the mindset and all that, because it's a mental block for a lot of people. Why they don't do what they know they should do in the right situation. Got nothing to do with the stock market. They know what they should do. They go opposite of it and it hurts them. And you'd be like, why you did that? Oh, I can't tell you. That's a mental, that's a psychological issue. It's people in prison behind this type of stuff. So don't want to be long-winded. Appreciate everybody for coming out. Um, the link to the course is going to be in the description. Like I said, we're getting ready to roll into the last six months of the year. Invest in yourself, invest in your skill set. Stop trying to get a, a ten thousand dollar return off of a hundred dollar investment. The game don't work that way. Be willing to sacrifice for what you want. Be willing to put that time in and, you know, associate yourself with people that's trying to move somewhere in this world. And in my opinion, you can get what you want. David W. Williams, also known as Diamond Dave, I'll talk to you later.